Hello, everyone. Now, today we're doing a paper three, and I know you're, you're waiting for this for a very long time. And so, doing a paper three today, still continuing with our biology review, and it is for BGCSC, and we're looking at a 2019 past paper. All right, again, please remember to always write a school number, very important. Always write a candidate number, your surname, and your initials, very important. Now, also read through the instructions. Please be careful when you're going through the instructions. And also, if you're not sure about anything, please ask questions. Now, what is also important? This paper will determine your A's or your B's. And so, therefore, you need to treat this paper with care. Observe the marks given before you start answering the questions. All right, so let's dive into our first question. Now, for this first question, it said the diagram shows a vertical section through the human high. I have already gone through and labeled this for you. And so we have the labelings there. And so the first part of the question asks us now to draw lines on the diagram to label the following structures, lens, cornea, choroid. Now, again, um, with all these parts, it's very important for you to understand their functions as well. And so we have our cornea right here, we have our choroid, and the choroid is one of three layers. So there are three layers, uh, main layers of the eye. And so we have the retina, which is the innermost layer, the sclera, which is the outermost layer, and the choroid right in the middle. Now, we also see the optical nerve, we also see the blind spot, and the blind spot is where you find no light-sensitive cell. In other words, there is no rods and no cones at that point. Therefore, no image can be formed at the blind spot. Um, however, on some diagrams, you will see another indentation, which is called the fovea. The fovea is also called the yellow spot. The yellow spot is where you'll find a lot of light-sensitive cells or light receptors uh, um, in, the, in the name of rods and cones. And they are very important in producing sharp and very vivid images. We also have our suspensory ligament and our ciliary muscle. Those two muscles, they are very important in controlling the shape of the lens, particularly when you're seeing near object or far objects. Okay, and so we have the iris, and we also have the aqueous humor and the vitreous humor, and also the lens. Please make sure you go through, know the labelings, and also know their functions. All right, let's go to the other part of the question, and this part. It reads, state the function of the cornea. And so the cornea, the main function of the cornea is to refract light into the eye. Okay, so the main function to refract. And again, please remember for this quest, uh, this paper is all about writing quality over quantity. So please observe the marks and do not overwrite. Please look what the, question is, the questions are asking you to do before you start to write anything, okay? So this one is to refract light into the eye, okay? So refract light into the eye. Uh, let me separate these two words. So refract light into the eye. Um, it also serves another um, purpose or function. It also protects the internal part of the eye, okay? Protects the internal part of the eye. That's right, so very important for us to understand that. All right, so great. So that is our one mark answer. Now for the next part of the question here, it reads that the diagram shows how the pupil appears when you're standing in a dimly lit room. Now when in a dim room, the pupil will dilate. In other words, the pupil becomes wider. The reason for that is a taking more light for you to see much better, okay? Now, let's see exactly what the question is asking us now. And this part of the question, it reads that when you walk from a dimly lit room in the bright sunlight, explain how the changes in the pupil are brought about. And so first you have to know, remember, again, as I said to you, whenever you are in um, the dim room, your pupil dilate, but now you're in sunlight, so the pupil will constrict. So I'm going to give you the steps, and I'm going to draw a little diagram to show you exactly um, what is happening here. 
And so the first point to note here, very, very important to note this, this point, is that the pupil becomes smaller. Let me put this a little bit higher for you so it'll be clearer. Okay, so the pupil becomes smaller. In other words, it constrict. Okay, so it constrict. All right, so that's the first point you need to make. All right, so an another point that you can talk about right here, remember you're looking for two marks, okay? So another mark here is that the radial muscle, the radial muscle, all right, so the radial muscles, they will relax, all right? So the radial muscle relax, all right? So that's very important to understand that. And while that is happening, you have some other muscles which are called the circular muscle so the circular muscle they will contract okay so the circular muscle they will contract okay so they're working oppositely so while the radial muscles are relaxing the circular muscles are contracting and so let me draw a quick diagram here to show exactly what i'm talking about and so if you look at the original um drawing you notice that the pupil was large relatively large i'm gonna draw a smaller pupil compared to the first one so you could always go back to that diagram and you'll see so what you'll have here let me use some different colors um at least to show the difference here and so let me use probably blue okay and so within the iris so this first circle is the pupil and the second one is the iris okay so this larger part portion here is the iris and so you have some radial muscle so these will be a radial muscle they get longer, okay, which means they are relaxing, okay, and so the circular muscles, they will contract, okay, so that's the point I thought real fast, okay. All right, so I'm going to put in, um, let's use, all right, let's say green, okay, and the circular, the circular muscle will kind of follow the pattern of the pupil, so the pupil is smaller than the circular muscles they themselves get smaller in other words they are contracting okay so the circular muscle will be inside the iris like that again the opposite will be true when you're in dim light okay so it'd be nice for you to compare the, the two diagrams together to see them nicely okay but just to point these out real quick all right let's jump on to the other part of the question and this part of the question here says, state why the changes to the pupil described in C1 is necessary. So in other, word, in other words, why here? Why the pupil constrict or get smaller? So that's what they're actually asking you. Why? Why is it important for the pupil to get smaller or constrict? All right, and so the answer for that is to reduce the amount of light entering the eye. Okay, because now you're in a bright area, you want to reduce the amount of light going into eye, into the eye. So to reduce the amount of light entering the eye. Okay, I'm right, trying to go a little bit fast. All right, all right, great. So that's the importance or why it's necessary for the pupil to constrict. And that's a one mark um, question, all right? So simple to reduce the amount of light entering the eye. All right, so great. All right, so let's now go on to this section here, which is um, section D of the question. It says, diagram shows light rays passing into the eye of a person with an eye defect. There is an eye defect, definitely, and I will show you why. Because here, the rays are meeting behind the retina. So it's meeting behind the eye. So therefore, this cannot be good because the image should form on the retina. In other words, the, the rays of light should meet on the retina. Otherwise, they should converge onto the retina. Okay? So let's see what they're actually asking us here to do, right? Just to make sure. All right. So they said, identify the eye defects. Um, defect shown in the diagram. So just to make a note real quick, okay, just an easy way to remember this thing. If the 
image is formed behind the eye, it therefore means that it's a long range. And so this person here is long sighted. Okay. If it was in front of the retina and not touching the retina, then that would be short sighted. Okay. So let's put the um, terminologies here. And so this could be a number of names given for long sightedness. And so let's just put long sightedness real quick. So long sightedness. All right, so it could be long sightedness. It could also be far sightedness. So that's another name for it as well, far sightedness. So whichever one you remember, that is absolutely fine. Okay, there, it have other name as well. And so you can also call this and put it at the bottom here for you. All right, just for you to know the names. I mean, one is sufficient because it's only a one mark question. Okay, so here is also called hypermetropia. Okay, and beside hypermetropia is also called hypropia. So I'm going to write that as well. There's H Y P E R O P I A. Okay, so hypropia. All right. So those are the names given to farsightedness. Okay. All right, so please make a note of those. Anyone is sufficient? Um, it's a one mark question. Now, part two said, complete the diagram by drawing the following. Uh, we needed to draw the lens, so let's look what they need us to draw. We need to draw the lens, use the correct defect. So we need to know the lens that def um, correct this defect. And it's a dotted lines to show the path of the, correct, uh, of the corrected light rays. So here, the, the light rays are not correct. So we need to draw the type of um, lens there. And so let's do that real quickly. All right, so the lens that we're going to draw here, now let's put in it in blue, is called a convex lens. So we're going to draw like that. And so it is curved outwards. Okay, so there's a convex lens. All right, let's put the name of it right here. There's a convex lens. All right, so convex lens. Now they ask us to draw dotted lines to show the, the correct um, path, the path for the light. The correct pathway. Um, first and foremost, again, they must converge onto the retina, which is this first line right here, or the first layer, in the most layer. And so what you want to do is to draw some dotted line, as I mentioned, dotted lines. All right. I know in the exam, you, your lines will be much straighter than mine. You could use a ruler to do that. But the idea, they must come from in the center of the lens, and then they will refract, which means they bend, and they bend onto the retina. Okay? So that will be the corrected pathway, all right? The, the one that passed in the middle will not be refracted. It goes straight through, okay? But all of them will be converging right onto the retina. All right, so great. Now, let's jump on to our next um, question or part of the question. Let's see exactly what is after this. All right, and so this one, say, diagram shows a nephron which is a kidney tubule. So that's what it's showing right there. Again, I've labeled this diagram to save some time for us. All right, and so here, I'll, let's see what it's asking. It says, state the names of the parts labeled Q and U. So of course, let's go to the diagram itself. So Q is the Bozeman capsule, and U is the glomerulus, okay? So we have those two parts, so there's no need for me to write them again. Again, we have our renal artery, or this is connected to the renal artery. And then we have the glomerulus, which is a network of capillaries. All right. And so we also call this end um, the afferent arteriole, okay? Or otherwise, I say it, um, renal artery, okay? Technically, it's connected to the renal artery, all right? And so we have our um, Bozeman capsule, which is this cup shaped structure right here. And then we also have our first convolution, and our first convolution is called a proximal convolution. And it is proximal because it is close to proximity to the Boltzmann capsule, very close to it. So you can say, okay, it is close to it. And so we have also what we call a distal convolution because 
this is in a greater distance away from the Boseman um, capsule. So that's easy way to remember it, okay? All right, and so here we have a loop of Henley, and the loop of Henley is a loop all the way to the bottom of this portion here, and then we have our collecting duct. All right, so now let's go into the question. Again, we already labeled this. You can go to the diagram and look at our, uh, the names for these two parts. Again, um, Q is the Bozeman capsule, and U is the glomerulus. All right, so next part of the question right here, because we have a lot to go through, so I'm going to go through it as quickly as possible. All right, so here now we say glucose is normally reabsorbed um, from the filtrate in nephron. So in other words, things that are leaving the, the glomerulus and go into the, the tubules, some substances are reabsorbed. And notice say that um, glucose is reabsorbed from the filtrate. In terms of what is filtered, glucose is eventually taken from it. So here now to state the meaning of the term reabsorbed in this context. So what does it mean to be reabsorbed in the context of glucose um, reabsorbing from a filtrate, okay? So it is simply saying, and this is only a one mark um, question here, so glucose, all right, is being returned to the blood, okay? So glucose is being returned, being returned to the blood, okay? So it's taken back into the blood. That's simple it, okay? It goes back to the blood. And there's a reason for this because, again, for a healthy kidney, urine will not be found, um, glucose will not be found in urine. Otherwise, the person is deemed to be diabetic. All right, so now part two here, it said, where in the diagram does this process occur? And this is just a one mark. And so, just to point this out real quick in terms of what they labeled, let's see here, and it's generally taking place of any of the convolutions and also the loop of any. So, T and S will be our answer. They did not label um, the distal convolution, so we're going to work with T and S based on the labelings that they gave us. Um, in this question, again, just to point this out, they did not state, write the name. They said, where? And so based on the diagram there, we're going to put them right there. But I'm actually going to put the name as well. But for the, for the examination purpose, there is actually T and S. Okay, that's what they're actually asking you. But where exactly um, is in the convolutions, okay, so in the convolutions, all right, which means the proximal and also the distal convolution and also the loop of Henley. So there are the positions or places that this is taking place okay all right so great all right so once we have that covered um we know we can jump on now to the next part of the question all right so let's say loop of Henley. all right so great all right so this part now is a state one possible cause of glucose remaining in the urine so one possible cause of this again i mentioned it a little bit earlier and this is because the person is what? Diabetic. So because of diabetes, okay, the person is diabetic. All right, so diabetes or the person is diabetic. Or in other words, to expound on this is if there is a failure, right, in producing insulin in the body, okay? So if the so pancreas is not producing insulin in the body, then yes, you may find um, urine in the kidney. So let's put that point there. Um, failing to produce, I'm just going to write it really, really short. Okay, so failing to produce insulin. All right, and that's why the person is diabetic, okay? Just to make a note of that. All right, so to give you some additional information there. So diabetes, or the person is diabetic, and the reason why the person is diabetic because the person is failing to produce what? Insulin, okay? Uh, in other words, the person I is um, having problems in converting blood glucose into glycogen. So that is not happening. Or the cells are unable to use up the glucose. So insulin is not efficient in taking glucose to the cells. So just to add that, those, po those points in, so if you should get any question on, that, on diabetes, you know how to treat it. All right, so let's now jump to part four. Part four now states... Or reads, is a state one substance other than glucose that can be found in part P 
but would not normally be found in part R. So let's look at exactly what they're talking about, um, part P and R. So part P in this diagram is the arteries and capillaries. Okay, so the arteries or the capillaries anyway right here, pretty much the same thing. Okay, so in the artery or the, uh, or the afferent arteriole or the capillary. So same thing here. And R will be the collecting duct. So just to point out, this is the blood that's going towards the nephron. In R, that's where urine will be. Okay, so you have a composition of urine in the collecting duct. Okay, so now let's quickly talk about that. So indirectly, what they're actually asking you, what do you find in the blood? Okay, because it's asking you one other substance other than glucose that can be found in P, but not in R. So what can you find in the blood? but not in urine one other thing other than glucose and this here would be blood proteins okay the blood proteins are not found inside of the blood so blood proteins all right so great all right and again just to point this out the reason why why you do not find blood proteins in the urine because blood proteins are too large to pass through the capillaries if you do find blood proteins inside of the urine, it could mean a number of things. One, it could simply mean that there's an infection, okay? It could mean there, there's an infection or there's some rupture of um, the tubules or capillaries or so on, okay? But generally, you will not find any blood proteins inside of urine because they're too large to pass through the glomerulus by filtration. All right, so let's jump on the part C now. And in part C... It said, name the hormone that regulates the water content of urine and state where it is produced. Okay, so the name of this, let me put the abbrevi give it the abbreviation first. And the abbreviation here is ADH. And ADH is the abbreviation, abbreviation for antidiuretic hormones. And so let me write that real quick for you. So it's antidiuretic hormones. hormones okay all right so that's exactly what it is so adh is help to regulate water inside of the um body okay very important for you to know that the antidiuretic hormone so please make a note of that and where is this um produced and so it's produced in the brain but it's a specific part of the brain that produces this and so it is produced in what they call the hypothalamus okay It is produced in the hypothalamus, and that's a part of the brain, okay? All right. So, again, you try to be specific with all the answers, all right? Be very specific. Okay, so the hormone is antidiuretic hormone, ADH, or and it, and it is produced by the hypothalamus, all right, which is a part of the brain as well, or in the brain, I should say. All right, so part two of this now, which is the final part of this question, it said, Explain why urine is darker yellow on a hot day than, than on a cool day. Okay, so what you need to remember now, what do you do on hot days? Hot days, you will tend to sweat, okay? So since you're sweating, then you have less water in the urine. Okay, so to earn your two marks, a matter of fact, I may just give you like three marks. But anyhow, to, to earn your full marks and you're looking for two marks, which means two points, so always gauge your answer based on the number of marks. And so here we can see more water is used for sweating. So that's the basic thing that is happening here. More water is being used for sweating or to produce sweat. Okay. All right. So to produce sweat or for sweating. The next point that you can hide right here, because more water is sent to form uh, sweat or to make sweat or to produce sweat, then as a result of that, what happened here is that urine becomes more concentrated, okay? So the urine, uh, the urine becomes more concentrated, okay? Becomes more concentrated. All right, so that's very important. And since the urine becomes more concentrated, all right, it's simply because of less water present in urine, okay? All right, so uh, we were concentrated. 
due to less water all right due to less water present okay or due to the presence of less water let us write up here due to the presence of less water okay so you do not have a lot of water in the urine because again uh, most of the water will, will be sent to make sweat to cool the body all right, so less will be in urine, and hence urine will be more concentrated. In other words, a high percentage or ratio of solute versus solvent, because what is a solvent, yes? Okay, all right. Now let's jump to our next question here. And this next question is said that the photograph shows a magnified image of a cross-section of a part of a dicotyledonous stem, including the vascular bundle. So this comes from a dicotyledon, okay? So a dicotyledonous um, stem. And so here we have the epidermis, which is the outermost layer. We have the cortex. We have structure A. And also we have structure um, B, okay? And this um, is asking us now to name the tissues labeled A and B. And so let me just talk about what, what A and B um, are. And so just to make a quick note, just to kind of clarify this real quick for you. This is a stem, right? And so the, the, the two structures here make a part of the vascular bundle. So A and B, they make up the vascular bundle. And the vascular bundle contains the xylem and the phloem. And so the xylem will be on the innermost part of the stem, and it makes a lot of sense because it is further away from the outermost part of the, the plant um, because it wants to retain water. If the xylem was closer to the surface of the stem, then water could evaporate from it. Is it okay, there's a possibility that water could evaporate from it, or the water becomes too hot, all right, and then it, would, it could damage cells, okay? And so the water needs to be as cool as possible, so it's in the in the innermost part of the stem and so this piece out here will be the phloem and that transport plant food okay so that could take a little bit of warmth but what if what is too warm then it could damage um, structures within the plant and so this is the um, xylem okay so b is the xylem a is the phloem okay so we ask us to label those and so again um, a is phloem just write that right here quickly okay so phloem and B is the xylem, okay? All right, great. Now, part two of this question reads now, is that on the diagram, draw a line to the cambium, okay, to the cambium tissue, and label it with the letter C. One mark question. Now, the cambium is what separates the xylem from the phloem, okay? So, if you will find the cambium between the xylem on the phloem so this area right here this region right here that i'm gonna put this color here yes so this region here that is the cambium let's call that c all right now now the cortex um just to make a note of the um the cortex the cortex contain two main type of um tissues or cells would contain what they call colenchyma and parenchyma i could just write that in quick quickly for you so the xylem um, is made up, the cortex, I should say, made up of what they call colenchyma. Okay, you have colenchyma right there. And you also have what they call parenchyma. Okay. All right, so parenchyma and colenchyma. All right, so those um, two parts here will make up the um, cortex. Okay. All right. So now let's jump on to the next part of question right here. And the next part of question is part three of this um, question. It said, name the two types of cells found in tissue A. And tissue A is the phloem. And so what the two things that make up the phloem, and this is what you need to remember, always remember um, the companion cell. Um, the companion cell is very important for the, for, for the phloem to work. Very important. Okay, so the companion cell... Um, the companion cells, they are very important for the phloem because the phloem itself do not have no, um, any nucleus and 
country, right? So the company and cell will produce the energy needed for the phloem to work, okay? So it really helps um, with the functioning of the um, phloem vessel, okay? The other one um, or types of cell that you, that you will find in the phloem is what I call the sieve um, tube cell, the sieve tube cells, okay? All right, Ag again, in this, you'll have scalenchyma and um, parenchyma, all right? But does that leave the two main cells right there, companion cell and sieve tube cells, okay? All right, so great. Now, part B of this now is to state one function that tissue A and tissue B have in common. So, in other words, what is common between the xylem and the phloem? And it talk about one function. State one function. Looking for the function now. Okay, not structure, but functions. I want to be careful whenever you're reading these, these um, questions. Um, be careful of, of the keywords that they use in it. Okay, so one common function between A and B, which is the phloem and xylem, is to do one main job. And it's to transport substances throughout the plant. Okay. So the common thing here is to transport substances throughout the plant, okay? So that's what is common betwe between both um, tissues. All right. So now we have it covered. Um, we could jump on to the next part of the question right here. And this part says state two ways in which the functions of tissue A differ from those of tissue B. So looking at O A is different from B. Okay. So in tissue A, which is the phloem, so remember tissue A is the phloem. And so the phloem, the substance will flow in two directions. Okay, so it's two directional flow. Okay, let's do it real quick. Write it in short. So two directional flow of substance, two directional flow of substances, okay? And so, um, let me just write up substances. And particularly it's glucose, but we're just generalizing right here because it said the um, difference in function. So the two directional flow of substances, okay? And in other words, um, when I say two directional, I mean it goes up and comes down, okay? So you go up in the plant and also come down in the plant. So it's a two directional way. All right, another difference here is that the phloem, because of the movement of these substances, again, sometimes they go against the concentration gradient and all of that, so it requires some form of what? Energy. So it requires energy. The, 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 the movement within the xylem, which is structure B, will not require any energy. It will, it will just move um, passively through the xylem. Okay, and also the xylem only f um, allow one directional flow. So the xylem will flow from the roots all the way to the leaves. Okay, so, so water will not flow from the, from the leaves going down, but rather flow from the roots going up. That's how the xylem um, vessels work. Okay, now let's go to the other part of the question right here. And this part is state two ways in which tissue B is adapted for its function. So what tissue B is, is about, again, is the xylem. Tissue B is the xylem. And so now we get to talk about the xylem. And so two ways in which um, xylem vessels are adapted to carry their function. And is one is they're dead. Okay? So they are dead. The mm -hmm. tissue B is dead and lignified. Okay? Lignified. So that's very important as well. So they're dead and lignified. Now, what is so important with this, right? Just to point this out. To be dead, to be dead cell, um, is that because water is passing through it. If water passes through living tissues, then the cells in that living tissue will absorb the water. So the xylem vessels, they are dead vessels, so water could stream through them easily without being absorbed, okay? So think, think about a plastic straw versus probably a living tissue straw. Then a plastic, they will allow water to flow through much easier compared to a living tissue, right? Or a living um, tube. All right. So the other f uh, adaptation right here, right? And it's a state, so you're going to state, you don't say explain, it's a state them. And so, 
you, you could make a short, short note because they are dead, they are low, easy streaming of water. And the next one is that they are narrow. Narrow. Okay? And so then the narrowness of them, um, or it could be a narrow continuous tube, okay? So it's a narrow continuous tube. Okay, so there's um all right, so narrow continuous tube. And very important to be narrow and continuous because the xylem being narrow, it is suitable for what they call a capillary action, which means water could stream through easier. Because since water is cohesive and adhesive, it could easily stick to the walls of the xylem because it's narrow and also allow that continuous flow of water um, because of pulling of each water molecules by the cohesion and the adhesion of water. So when water is sucked through what they call transpiration pull, it will pass through easier. Okay, And again, the purpose for being narrow is to enhance capillary action. All right. So great with that. Let's go to the next question here. All right. And we are almost, let's say, te technically halfway through the paper um, because you have four questions like this and then you jump on to a um, essay type questions at the back. But we'll talk about that when we get there. Okay. Now, question number four is some farmers grow GM crops such as BT corn, which have been produced using the bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis. So this bacteria, um, Bacillus thuringiensis, is a, is a type of or strain of bacteria that will do something to the crop. I don't want to get into it yet until I actually um, reach that part, right? It's a growing BT corn allows the farmer to reduce the use of pesticides. So here we have some clue about why they use this bacterium within the plants. In fact, um, Bacillus thuringiensis actually produce a specific type of protein that will mimic pesticides, right? And that's why they get kind of destroy pest, um, pest. But let's wait a little bit and see exactly what's going on here, right? It said, what do the letters GM stand for? stand for and so gm actually uh, means genetically modified okay so it is genetically modified let's write that in real quick genetically modified all right so great so genetically modified that's what it is um also another word that you may see instead of gm is gmos so let's let's just put that here for you real real quick gmos um you may see this as well okay gmos GMOs, right? I, I, again, you may see this um, instead of say GM, and, and GMOs is simple mean genetically modified organisms, okay? Just to point it out. So it is genetically modified organism. Pretty much it means the same thing, okay? So um, they may have one or the other genetically modified um, organisms. All right, again, this is not the, that's not the answer. This is just saying if you see GMOs instead of GM, you could write this, okay? I'd just like to give a little bit more information um, so at least you know a little bit more in depth of what is happening and so you could answer other questions as well, okay? Because remember, the questions may not come exactly as you're seeing them now, but at least you get some insight and some um, knowledge um, just in case the question may come similarly, right? Or a similar question may show up. All right, so now part two of this question. It said, explain how the bacillus thuringiensis is important in BT corn production. So how is it important? First, as I mentioned to you, right, is that it will produce a certain protein or it actually kills um, pests. It's a bacteria that actually kills the pest, okay? There's a mechanism in which, in which it, uh, it kills the pest, all right? I don't want to get into that um, right now. There's a lot of information to go through. But what I want to do is to see how we can capture our two marks. This is a two marks question. Very important, right? And so um, how, how using right this bacterium is so important in, 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 in crop production? How is it important? One is that the, the bacteria will, will control pests. So that's the bottom line, right? It controls pests. So you need to work on that line. All right, so it will kill or destroy pests that eat the corn, okay? So what it's preventing in this case is preventing 
loss of crops, okay? So let me just put it as this, reduced crop loss, okay? So it reduced loss of crops, or so let's say crop loss, okay? Crop loss will make it a little bit shorter. Okay, so it reduced crop loss, that's, that's a point right there, that's one point. And so let's explain this. So how does it reduce the loss of crops? It's simple by killing pests, okay? So it do this by killing pests or control pests, okay? So they, they so um, BT, which is Bacillus thuringiogenesis, will control um, pest, okay? So get inside the pest, such as insects and so on, and will eventually kill, kill the insects, okay? So kill the pest. And remember now, pests like caterpillars or other insects may eat the corn leaves, right? And so killing the pest, the, the corn will, will grow properly and flourish as it should. So it reduces um, loss of crops, all right, by controlling the pest or killing the pest, okay? So control or kill pest, whichever one you want to put um, is also fine in that context, killing um, pest. Let me put, pluralize this real quick. All right. And because pests may destroy the um, crops, so definitely you may say, okay, you may reduce crop loss by controlling pests, controlling or killing pests that may um, kill or eat the crop, okay? All right, so let's look at another point that we can talk about right here. And one is that you can end up with a greater production, okay? So greater crop production. Let's put that as a point here. Greater crop production production how is this helping to produce more crops again it ties in with the first point because if less crops is being destroyed and not just the plant by itself but even the the the, the corn directly which is, which is the fruit producing by by the the corn if those are destroyed then definitely um you cannot use them for marketing because of course appearance will be a, will be a very critical point um, to sell your, your produce. Okay, so yes, crop production may increase as well, and um, greater crop production, or you can uh, add this this way, you can say more um, plant yield or crop yield. Okay, crop yield, which simply means that um, you're getting more out of what you're producing. Okay, so nothing is being lost, or you have less lost. Another thing you can talk about here. Why it's important? Because you have more profit as well. So more profit could be a neck, another point. I'm just giving you as much point as possible. All right, so you have more profit. Why more profit is simply because you're producing more, okay? So greater production leads to more profit, okay? Another one you can, um, another reason why you could have more um, profit is simply because you're using less pesticides because the BT will kill the pesticides, don't need to buy pesticides. Okay, you only focus on the production of the crops and no money will be spent on pesticides. Okay, so again, um, less uh, money being used on pesticides. Okay, so instead of using spending money on pesticides, you could use that money in buying machinery or something to make the crop production go fast and better. All right, so you can divert that money towards something else that is meaningful and productive. All right, the only access for two marks really right you're looking for two marks but again you know you can decide um the most appropriate answers for your questions again do not write too much stick to the points and give um, the examiner exactly what they want okay now part b here so the graph below shows the relationship between bt corn and pesticides used in the united states now here we have a key the straight line is for pesticides use um, kilogram per hectare and the square boxes on the line that so this line here with the square boxes represent the percentage bt corn grown and so let's observe our graph carefully and so on our y-axis here we have the percentage corn grown in area and then we have the number of years going across right and so when you look at the graph careful look at the two lines they're going in two, di two different directions really right then we'll let's look at the questions and see what we can decipher from this graph. Now the first question reads: State the general trend. State the general trend in pesticides used and the percentage BT corn grown. 
So, in other words, look at the two lines and state the general trend. So, the general trend here, if you notice it, let's go back on it. You notice the bold line, talk about the, the use of pesticide. So, the use of pesticide is going this way, so it's decreasing over a number of years. And the percentage corn grown is being increased over the number of years, right? So, um, the general trend is here that the usage of pesticide decrease while the percentage corn grown will what increase okay so the use of pesticides decrease while the percentage of corn grown of corn grown uh oh of corn grown increases okay all right so pretty much that's the general trend so um again we we state as the pesticide decreases over the years the percentage of corn grown increases and so one affect the other one all right so you can see as they grow more more of these corns then the use of pesticide now what decrease okay that's a general trend all right so let's look at the next part of this question right here and this next part of the question is during which years um, does the graph not show this trend? When are you not seeing this trend? In other words, when are you not seeing an increase in the growth in the growing of crops or the growing of this corn and the use of pesticide being decreased at the same time? So let's look at when we're not seeing this. And so if you look at the graph carefully, let's uh, make some markings here. Um, well, I could yeah. Let's do some highlighting now. Check, I check this out real quick. Notice here there's a stable line, right? That means there's no decrease in the pesticide usage at that time. It's stabilized, right? And also notice here as well that there was a decline here and then it stabilized here. So right here is pretty much one of those possible answers, right? And so I'm going to show you different ways you could answer this, right? So that's a possible answer right there. All right, so let's look at something else now. Let's look at something else. Look in this section right here. Let's put a different color for this, right? Notice here there's a drastic, drastic, drastic decrease, drastic decrease in the use of pesticide, and then there's a sudden increase. So what could cause this increase? So there's a decrease and sudden, sudden decrease, sudden increase. So that did not follow in the particular trend, right? So in this section again, we have a problem, right? So we have from 1999 and 2001. That's one possible answer. Also, from 2001 to 2003 is another possible answer. Or you could just put all together and state it is from 1999 all the way until what? 2003. Because from that point to that point, there is no consistency in decreasing and increasing. So again, you could put this in three different ways, I may tell you. One, you could say from 1999, okay, from 1999 to 2001, or you could say from 2001 to 2003, or you could simply say from 1999 to 2003, okay? So those are possible options right there. The trends are just not correct. So let's put the possible options that I have here. So I have uh, 1999. Okay, all the way to uh, 2001. You see that trend right in the graph. And then another, possi another possibility here, um, just to give you possible options, right? But I'm going to show you what I will do here. And so you also have one 2001 to 2003, okay? But again, these are continuous years, right? So the best option you want to put right here Right, in, in terms of this not consistent, is really from 1999, so from 1999 all the way to 2003. Okay, at that point of the graph is just out of work. It's just up and down. If you notice this, at point is stable, sometimes it's down, and so it's not giving you a true reflection of the other um general trends because remember the general trend is that as one increase the next one is what decreasing and what is increasing is the growth of the uh, growth of the crops 
and the, the crease should be in the pesticides. All right. So again, you can look at the graph and see exactly where I'm coming from. All right. All right. So let's jump on. But again, just to kind of reiterate, is that 1999 to, to 2003, that's what I'll put as my answer because that's a, a total span of time. But I'm showing you that these are possible, possible answers as well. Okay. All right. So let's go to part three. And it said, give one reason shown on the graph why there was no change in pesticides used uh, between the years 1999 and 2001. So why there was no decrease? Okay, why there's no change? So let's go back to our graph here now. Okay, and say exactly between 1999, there was no change in pesticides. So, they, so in other words, if you look at the graph, there's a straight line between these two years. So what, what you notice here is that there's no change. There's no decrease. But look at the graph carefully. Notice what is happening here. There is a decline in the growth of the corn. So since there's a decline in growth of the corn, then based on what the, corn, the, the amount of corn left back, it therefore means that the pesticide does stabilize. The amount of pesticide used was just stabilizing. Okay, and then now if you notice here again, um, the, the, the amount of corn produced here was stabilized again, and then it started to increase, and then drastic decrease in the pesticide usage, right? So 1999 is a very good um, year, all right, in terms of um, not following the trend, if that's supposed to be a, a, uh, one of the answers that we mentioned earlier. All right, so let's talk about why now again. Why? Because notice here there's a decline in the growth of what? Crops. All right, or the particular corn, the BT corn. All right, so let's answer that real quickly. All right, so here now there was a what? A decline, so a decline um, in the growth of crops. So a decline. I say decline in um, the corn in the growth of BT corn. All right, so we know it's BT corn, just to say corn in this case. So, okay, so BT corn, okay, BT. Okay, so BT corn. All right, great. All right, so let's jump on to the next part of the question here, right? Now it says, suggest two environmental problems. We want to state two environmental problems, all right, which could result from the growth of BT corn. Two environmental problems. Now, Remember now, the corn was modified to kill pests, right? Now, remember now, in any ecosystem, we have biodiversity. So since we have biodiversity, we have other insects or organisms that may traverse on the corn, may not necessarily eat in the corn, right? But by traversing on it, or may even probably pick um, suck some juices from the corn leaf or so on. So there's a potential to kill non-targeted organism, okay? So, so one of the answer here is killing um, non-targeted. Let's put that that way, non-targeted. All right, non-targeted. Uh oh, all right, let's go back to this. Non-targeted. All right, so non-targeted organisms, all right? So again, let's say you want to kill caterpillars, you may end up killing um, bees and so on, all right? You may kill ladybugs, all right? So those are some possible um, things that may be destroyed if you do want to kill them. So yes, you may want to kill caterpillars, but you end up killing other, t uh, um, other type of um, insects, all right, or organisms. And so as a result of this, let me just put this in this way, killing organism, what you have as a result is a decrease in biodiversity, right? So a decrease in biodiversity. So I'm just showing a different way you could write this. So, all right, so biodiversity. Um, okay, so decrease in biodiversity. All right, so you may also have that. All right, so what are the problems that we may have as well? All right, so again now, because um, no pest is eating the corn or this particular corn, just let's say this corn now eventually cross pollinate with another type of crop or corn, right? So you have a cross pollination between corns, for example. 
And so it may be wild corn or, or a wild species of corn, right? And then this wild species, you know, because it cross contaminate, it cross pollinate with this um corn that can kill pests. So no pest may you know able to, to, to control or eat the wild corn. Okay. So what you can have, you know, cross pollination. So cross pollination could lead to invasive species because now the wild corn may become invasive, right? So it may, may lead to invasive um, crops or invasive species, okay? All right, so that's, that's another possible answer right there. Um, the next thing that we could have, again, all right, is that we could have an increase in the population of, an, of other pests. How is this possible? How could you have an increase in other pests if, if, B, if the BT corn is killing pests? How is it possible? All right, let's, let's put that and then I tell you real quick. Okay, so you can have an increase, okay, an increase in population of other pests, an increase in other pests. All right, and so let's tell you exactly how this will work. Now, remember now, let's say caterpillar, right? Let's say caterpillars are being destroyed by the BT corn, right? Caterpillars may be eating a particular, well, cat, uh, caterpillars may be a bad example to use because caterpillars, they are, they are herbivores, right? So, so let's say, um, for example, a particular pest, right, may eat another pest because of a food chain, okay? So let's say pest, um, pest A is being eaten by pest B, but the corn kills pest B only. So what will happen to pest A is that pest A will have the opportunity to grow and increase in population. And so there will become an increase in that population because there is no natural predators anymore. Because the BT corn could have killed the natural predators for that particular pest. All right? And so it could have an increase of pests due to lost a natural predator, right? Okay, so, the, um, so um, because of loss of natural predators, put it right here. Um, because of loss of natural predators. So there's no natural predators anymore, okay? All right, so no natural predators are there, so therefore um, that pest could increase in population real rapidly, okay? So those are things that may happen within the environment. And of course, increasing uh, increase in another pest uh, may cause a destruction of other types of crops. So you, may, you save the corn, but you end up destroying other crops because you destroy natural predators of other organisms. In other words, no, you actually change the dynamics of the ecosystem. All right, so let's go to part D now. So stay two ethical issues associated with using GM crops, such as BT corn, as a food source. As a food source. All right, and so that is important. You say as a food source. So already we covered the environmental stuff. So what about using it as a food source? Remember, corn is in a lot of stuff, right? Corn is present in a lot of stuff. Um, think about um, the children that eat snacks. So um, a lot of children, yeah? A lot of um, children. Mm, um, a lot of children snacks um, or, or children eat snacks that contain corn, right? A lot of children eat snacks that contain corn okay that contain corn or corn products and so therefore now um you expose children to the modified corn which may have some effect on them we don't know right so a lot of children eat um snacks that contain corn and ends you may expose them. So you could continue with this and write some more on it, which you know this could expose the children um, to the genetically modified components. And this may have some developmental issues or developmental problems um, as it concerns to the children. Okay. So let's put that let's put that other piece right there. Uh, so this could lead to developmental issues okay the developmental issues 
All right, and so that is a concern that can be a concern for the person that ethically, um, ethical issue for some persons. Okay, um, again, the next thing that we can talk about is that people generally consuming pesticidal proteins because again, the the the, the bacterium, okay, which is the Bacillus thuringiensis, will produce specific proteins. So guess what will happen now? So if the bacteria lives in the corn, so therefore um, people uh, may consume, okay, may consume pesticidal, pesticidal um, proteins, okay? So let's um, write that real quick, all right? Pesticidal proteins, all right? So that's um, very um, important again. So that's just something for us to consider, all right? All right, so pesticidal proteins. All right, so that's something that you really need to consider. In, think about eating the corns and um, eating the corn, all you're getting from the corn is some protein that are pesticidal. So eventually, um, this protein may be clogging the system or remaining the system for a long period of time and accumulate, and accumulate there and eventually may lead some some problems such as cancer and all of those type of stuff okay so so definitely um it could be a problem so that could be health risk or um issues not only that let's say in some um cases that persons may have allergies okay so let's put allergy um development of allergies um to consuming such a plant with the with the BT um BT corn. And we can also have emergence of diseases too because we do not know probably the long term effect of consuming these um product or what the long term effect may have on um people, even though it may be deemed safe, but long term effect we may never know. Okay. So emergence um uh emergence of new diseases. So there's a lot of stuff that we can talk about. There's only two points, but I'm just giving you some extra stuff that we can talk about, right? And again, emergence of new diseases is, 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 is the next one. And next thing that could be unethical or ethical issues or may raise ethical issues is the unpredictable effects, okay? I kind of mentioned it when I talk about allergies and emergence of new diseases. So generally, you could talk about the unpredictable, okay? Unpredictable effects. We just may never know, Okay. So those are possible answers, and again, it's based on you explain um, your answers, just to make it logical and um, suitable answers for the question. All right, so now we are finished with that part of the question. Now, this is the part that I know most of you are anxious for. Now, in section B, there are three questions for you to choose two. Now, my quick advice to you is always read through all the questions, right? Look at the questions that will earn you maximum marks or most marks, because sometimes a question may start off uh, may start off real easy, but may end up really difficult for you going to the middle or to the end. So ensure that you choose the best questions that could earn you the most marks. All right. So what I've done here, I have already gone through and answered these questions for you because they are writing um, questions, right? And so let me jump into it real quick, okay? All right, so here now we have um, the section B part of this question, right? Again, um, I've typed it out. So again, um, all rights reserved to the EGCSE uh, paper. But to make life easier for us, then I just type out most of the stuff. So this is, this, um, this is the questions. And so question five, um, I'm gonna, I've separated, so I'm going to go through them. So you, you read through the question, you can skip through the questions, see which question is best for you. So this is now question number five right here. Okay. So again, I'm answering them in parts. And so question number five um, reads, it's a draw a simple labeled diagram of the coral polyp, okay? And so here I could move a little bit faster because I've already answered all the questions for you. This is four marks. So you want to outline the diagram, which is a mark, and then possible three structures and so we have the tentacles we have the mouth we have the gut okay here is also called the pharynx as well right so you could also name name this part as the pharynx that is right here below the mouth area okay and so that's four 
easy marks okay just to draw the quote polyps all right so again just to point this out each question worth 20 marks okay each question worth 20 marks so you get a average of 80 marks or 80, 80 points out of this uh, paper so now part two of this um question which is question number five is it the coral polyp and the and the brown green algae which is zooxanthellae share a special relationship so the coral polyp and the brown green algae which are called zooxanthellae share a special relationship now the question now reads says state the name and describe the significance of this special relationship and so notice there is five marks now do not think about just go ahead and just start writing a lot of stuff because you'll miss your marks you can put them in points to ensure to cover all the points there's not a problem in doing that in fact it's easier to be marked because the examiner will see exactly what you're writing okay so here i have the answers here and so the name of this relationship is called mutualism or mutualistic symbiosis what this means is that both organisms are benefiting and none of them is being harmed okay so none of them is being negatively affected Let's now go through it now. And so here we have um, the coral polyp gets oxygen, okay, because the, the coral polyp is animal, is an animal. And the zooxanthellae are plant like algae, okay. When I say plant like, I mean they photosynthesize. They're not plants, they're algae, they're different. But they photosynthesize just like plants. And so you can think about the benefit between animals and plants, and it, and it pretty much will be the same thing, okay. So, the coral polyp gets oxygen, okay, because, again, the zoos and are photosynthesizing and producing the oxygen. The, the polyp also gets color from the zoos and So, the brightly colored um, corals, they get their color from the zoos and Now, what the zoos and get in return, I'm looking for here a total of five points. So, we name, we name the, the, the relationship is one point. So, four other points should earn all five marks. And so here I have a little bit, one extra really. And so the zooxanthellae gets, um, the zooxanthellae, they get carbon dioxide uh, because again, the polyp is animal and so they will respire and produce carbon dioxide. And then the zooxanthellae also get a place for shelter, okay? The zooxanthellae now also get nutrients from the waste products that are released from the animal because um, like, like, the, like the nitrogenous waste for them to, to grow and develop, right? So the nitrogenous waste coming from the polyp will be used by the algae for their growth and development. Now, I want to think about something, when think about benefits of organisms, right? For us, we think about um, clothing, food, and shelter, right? We think about that. But in 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 the wild or in the ecosystem we think about habitat and food sources right so most times the benefit will gear towards habitat and their food sources all right now let's jump to the next question here this question states reads state two ways in which reef is important. A matter of fact, it's supposed to read coral reef. I think I'll leave out the word coral reef. So, stay two ways in which coral reefs is important to Nassau Grouper and describe two adaptations for its survival on the coral reef. Okay, so this is supposed to be um, coral reef. Okay, so let's. All right, a matter of fact, I don't need to put that in. Let me just go over that. All right. Um, all right, so let's just run into it real quick. Okay, so here now, um, just to point this out. Again, um, two ways in which the coral reef is important to the Nassau grouper and describe two adaptations for its survival on the coral reef. So first and foremost, let's look at the importance. Again, when we talk about importance, we talk about habitat and food sources, right? So that's easy escape to talk, think about importance of any organism. How is it benefiting as a living space? And how is it benefiting in gaining food? And not only habitat, because habitat include protections as well, right? Because it's a place uh, for safety, that is good. Okay, so in terms of habitat, because the, 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 group, the grouper will get a place, a suitable place to live, and also get a lot of food sources, because the coral reef for the grouper is rich in a variety of food sources, okay? 
different food sources are there. So the adaptation now of, of the grouper itself to survive on the coral reef is when the grouper is able to camouflage. And it camouflage, camouflage easily, and so it could catch prey better. Okay, so it camouflage easily to catch prey. Okay, so that's very important there. Now, again, what other, what other adaptation the, the grouper has is that grouper, they have a large mouth and a great suction to swallow relatively large um, prey. Because on the coral reef, you'll find, um, tend to find larger fish and so on, okay? Or larger organisms compared to other parts, all right? Because the, the, um, the coral reef, in fact, is a flourishing ecosystem. All right, so those are two other things right there. Part C, again, this allows me to go a little bit faster because I have these typed out, all right? And it's kind of easier because, um, again, I could not go through each paper and then write them because a lot of stuff to write. Again, each question worth 20 marks. So part C now says state two natural threats and three man-made threats that affect the coral reef. And so five marks, two natural threats, Three man man made threats, five total marks. All right, so let's jump to it. Now the answer here now, in terms of natural threats, I list more than two, even though they ask for two, but I'm just giving you options. So just in case you see some question like this. So again, we have diseases and natural and natural ways, okay, um, of threatening any ecosystem. All right, we can't escape diseases, but to control diseases now is a different story. Now hurricanes. Hurricanes will come, or they may come. Climate change. So, of course, the climate change in terms of high temperature, low temperatures, and so on, are different things within the environment that change the, the climate and make it either suitable or not so suitable for organisms to survive. And another natural threat you may have is invasive species. Okay, So species may end up migrating into different um, sections of the coral reef, all right, and then cause some problems in terms of um, eating natural predators or consuming a lot of things, a lot of organism, and even in some cases, it could, could cause some organism to go extinct. All right, so man-made threats. One of them is using chemicals, okay? So if you use chemicals to capture fish, especially on or around the coral reef, could also damage the, cor the, the, the coral polyps and also kill the zooxanthellae, which leads to... Chlor um, coral bleaching, okay? Um, let's say persons are snorkeling, swimming. They may break corals for their personal use or, or for souvenir. Or may break the corals and break them off. And remember, corals really take a slow time to grow. Overfishing, right? And also poaching is also threats to coral reef as well. Because overfishing, again, you take out a lot of certain organisms or, or a particular fish resource. And what may happen is that you may disturb the natural balance and diversity of the coral reef, which may end up leading to a cascade in, in destructive activities. All right? And which definitely you do not want. All right? Pollution, definitely. Um, there's no more waste anywhere, everywhere. Um, could end up in a coral reef and damage the, the, the coral polyps. Let's say plastic bags or cans may end up going over um, a coral, for example. It could cause the coral not to grow anymore, um, lacking off certain resources, even with sunlight not reaching the, the, the zooxanthellae to make that nice symbiotic relationship to continue. So there's a number of things that happen. Um, destruction of habitat by simply even dredging or even building um, buildings such as hotels, such as um, resorts and, and um, resorts. Um, and a number of things that a person could build on the, on the, on the seaside or on, on the ocean view. And so a person may build up a lot of buildings there that may end up destroying hab habitats. Okay? Think about the deposit of silt over the, over the coral reef. could be very, very destructive. Right? All right. So part two of this um, question is a state two ways the Bahamian government tries to conserve the coral ecosystem. All right, and remember this is say tries, okay? Because sometimes the laws are there or things are in place, but people still go ahead and breach these things. And then sometimes it's so difficult to keep watch the entire ocean um, or the entire ocean, right? Or the, or the ocean space. It's very difficult. 
because it's so wide and far, okay? But one of the, the ways that government try is to have a close season for some of the reef organisms, such as the group crayfish, right? Because they are very useful on the coral reef. So therefore, give them time to reproduce so you maintain the population is a good effort in maintaining or protect the reef itself. They try to uh, provide educational programs, um, pamphlets, flyers, uh, documentaries, really, and even advertisement, right? And so that's one way they try to protect, protect, it, so, uh, protect the coral reef because if persons are become knowledgeable and understand the impact of the coral reef to their own livelihood, then they may have an interest in taking care of it as well, right? So that's another way. All right, they also have regulation against fishing gears, such as the use of scuba gears, use of nets um, in terms of catching fish, because use net, nets could also break um, corals as well, right? Get hooked to coral um, reefs and break coral apart and all those type of stuff. Also, they have regulation against the use of chemicals, such as bleach and explosives, okay? So those are some of the possible ways. And they ask us for, I think, um, two ways. Yeah, and only two marks, I give you four things. Again, you can even think of other ways to tries to protect the reef. All right, let's jump to question number six. This is question number six again. It is good for you to read through it and then go ahead and answer. Again, I break it down as I did to question number five. And so we have them in, in chunks to deal with. Okay, so let's go to the first part right here. Again, the first part here says blood is essential to the human body for many vital reasons not only for transport of materials, okay? So blood is generally for transport materials, but is not the only reason why it is vital or important for the human beings. All right, so let's go to part A. Now, part A says, state two changes in the composition of blood as it travels from the pulmonary artery to the pulmonary vein and describe how these changes are brought about. So when you think about it, the pulmonary artery is coming from the heart which is carrying deoxygenated blood and then when it reaches the pulmonary vein that is oxygenated blood coming from the lungs going towards the heart again okay and so it, 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 the question now is said we need to state two changes that take place in terms of the composition of blood right and we need to state how these changes um, are brought about so the first one here we're going to talk about here, and it's a four marks, right? So four marks mean you could state the two things for two marks. If you state them, it's two marks. And then, t and then state now or explain how they are brought about. It's the next two marks. So it's the four marks could, could come really easily. So for one is that there's an increase in oxygen. The level of oxygen in that blood will but increase. Let's go up here a little bit. Right? And how this takes place now is because oxygen from inhaled here will diffuse from the alveoli into the blood capillaries. That's how, it, that's how it take place, right? So that's two marks right there. Let's go for the next two marks. The next two mark is now is this, it, it's stating the next change. There is a decrease in carbon dioxide. How there is a decrease in carbon dioxide? Because now the carbon dioxide now diffuses all right, from capillary or from the capillaries into the alveoli. And so now, why, why it diffuse into the alveoli? Because carbon dioxide will be excreted by exhalation. But I put that in bracket for you to see what exactly what is happening. But to get the mark is really the diffusion of carbon dioxide from the capillaries or from the blood in the capillaries into the alveoli. Okay? So those are the two changes that take place in the blood moving from the pulmonary artery into the pulmonary vein. All right. So part B of this question now is identify two types of white blood cells. For each, for each cell, explain how it performs its role in the protection of the body from infectious diseases. Six whole marks for just to identify two white blood cells and how they help us to protect from diseases. So guess what? What are we thinking about when you look at these questions? Two marks to find the types of white blood cells. And to explain how each will be three marks each, okay? It will be um, two marks each, sorry. So therefore, a total of three marks for each type of white blood cell to name it and explain how it helps to protect against diseases. And that earned your six marks. So let's jump into it and see how, how best we could get our six marks right now. 
And so here we have one which is lymphocytes. And lymphocytes, now they produce antibodies that attack and kill invading organisms or pathogens such as bacteria and viruses. Now the antibodies that are produced by the lymphocytes, they, they will be used to destroy the structures of pathogens. All right? So hence we take our three marks. All right, let's look for the, the, for the other type now. This is called phagocyte. Now, phagocytes, they engulf and digest, in other words, destroy pathogens. So they take the, the, pathoge um, the pathogens in, bacteria or virus, all right, or any foreign object that the body recognizes should not be there, especially microscopic objects. And so they recognize the pathogen and change their shape and ingest the pathogen. And this process of changing shape to take something in is called phagocytosis. Okay? All right. And so you need to know even how to draw these things and, and know to explain them as well. Basic idea here. All right. And also you need to know how to identify um, phagocyte versus lymphocytes. Phagocytes is the irregular shaped nucleus. Um, lymphocyte is the regularly shaped nucleus. Okay. So that's one way to differentiate between both of them. All right, so part C of this question is now state, describe the process of blood clotting for five decent marks. Now let's dive into it. It's that when there is a cut or injury, platelets will rush to the site and create what they call a platelet plug, okay? Now as a result of this, blood clotting factors are activated and cause the following changes. And so a list of changes like this, again, there's no problem in listing. The important thing is, do you have the correct information? That's what is most important. Okay, you don't have to write in a whole big paragraph or two or three paragraphs. You don't need to do that. Just outline carefully in an organized way what is happening after the next. So the first thing that happened here, after I explain about blood clotting factors, is that the blood clotting factors turn inactive blood proteins into what you call prothrombin activator. Okay? Then after that, now the, the which is part two, it's a prothrombin activator now turns prothrombin into thrombin. Okay? The next thing that happens here is that the thrombin now converts the soluble um, fibrinogen, because um, fibrinogen is soluble. So actually, I could put the soluble in bracket because fibrinogen is soluble into an insoluble form which is called fibrin and these substances that i'll name or talk about just now they are all proteins okay they are all proteins all right so as a result now this causes a network of fibrin strands at the site of the injury and this will now reduce the loss of blood okay so that's the whole blood cutting process there all right great now let's look at part d of this question it said before a person is given a blood transfusion Doctors must cross-match the donor's blood to ensure that it is compatible with the, re the, with the recipient's blood. All right? They must make sure that the blood type or blood group. Now, part one says, state which group is known as the universal recipient and explain why. Now, blood group AB, the AB group is a universal recipient. Why? It's simply because... A and B, they are codominant to each other. An O group is recessive to A and B. So hence now, AB will always be expressed regardless of any combination. If you put A with AB, AB is going to show still. If you put B with AB, AB is going to be shown still. If you put O with A and B, then O has no effect on the changing of A and B because O is what? Recessive. So they can receive any blood type or any blood group without any form of problems. All right, let's look at part two. Now in part two, it's a state blood group which is most highly sought after by hospitals, um, blood, blood banks. It's a give an explanation for your choice. Why this blood group is the most sought after. Now, blood group O is the most sought after. One, because it is the most common group. Again, all other blood groups can receive this blood because it is recessive to A and B. 
Okay? So you can give to everybody. But one thing to point out here, which is not a part of the answer, is that the O group can only receive from O group, can receive from any other group. Okay? So just to make a point there, and it will include their three marks. Okay? Now, last question here, and this is the question. Any question seven? It's kind of started. No worries about that. I just tried to expand it, but I'm going to have them in pieces again in chunks um, to make life easier for us. I'll uh, write them over. And so the first part of the question reads that the diagram shows some of the stages of meiosis. We have diagram one, diagram two, and diagram three. In other words, we have stages. The stages are not in order. So please be aware of that. Okay. Now, let's jump into the question in the so What is meiosis? And for ease, for you again, the information is here. Meiosis is a type of cell division that produces gametes, and gametes are haploid cells. All right? And it said it produces four haploid cells by reducing the number of chromosomes in the parent cell by half. Okay? So it produces these cells that are half number of um, chromosomes as a parent cell. Again, um, just to make a point that it only produce gametes. Gametes are sex cells, okay? Eggs and sperms. Okay, just to point that out. All right, next part here, which is part two of this question. It said, explain fully what is occurring in diagram one, two, three for six marks. So saying two things for each stages will earn you six marks. All right, so let's look at how we can gain the six marks. Again, it said, explain fully. So there are certain things that they're looking forward to you to write on this exam. If you should see a question like this or this question, right? So let's look at it first and foremost. Diagram 1, we identify that as anaphase 1. Okay, it is anaphase 1. I have a diagram here as well beside you. So diagram is right beside it. So if you look at the diagram carefully, we say this is anaphase 1. Okay, how we know is anaphase 1? Of course, if you look at the number of... Um, Chromatids on one side, they are still joined together. And so that's how we know it's anaphase one. Okay. So in anaphase one, what is happening at anaphase one is that homologous chromosomes move to opposite poles of the cell. The sister chromatids still stay together. They are still together. And the reason why they are together is because the central mirrors do not split. So even though, and notice the word here, please, the word here is chromosome, chromosome, not chromatids. So, okay, so on the first one, the chromosomes move to opposite poles of the cell. The sister chromatids are still together, okay? So notice here you see the, the centromere here still, and then the chromatids, they are joined. And the reason for that is because the centromeres do not split or separate. Now, in diagram 2, again, the diagram there. For diagram 2, right, this is prophase 1. How we know it's prophase 1, you could see that the chromatids, they're overlapping, they're crossing over to each other and all that, right? So we identify it as prophase 1. Now, in prophase 1, homologous chromosomes come together, which form what they call a tetrad, okay? And the chromatids now, the, so the chromosomes come together, but the chromatids now, exchange genetic materials by a process called crossing over. And since there is a crossing over of genetic material, this now results in, in different combinations of alleles or allele combinations. Okay? So in other words, now, there, there's a random assortment of, of these genetic materials, and this is what contributes to offspring being different from each other. Okay? Because this is what brings about variety in organisms because of this crossing over process all right so great all right so our differences we hold it to crossing over in pro phase one all right so even if you are siblings from the same mother and father because of crossing over we have variation all right so in diagram three we identify diagram three as to be under phase two now how we know is this is under phase two Motherfucker can compare diagram one with diagram two. You notice they are almost identical. Ex except, notice my exception now. So notice the shape of the cell. Notice what is happening. They have been pulled apart opposite side. The same thing is happening to diagram three. They are pulling to each side. But what is pulling at each side now is different than what is happening in diagram one. So diagram 
three is anaphase two. What is happening here is that the centromere of each chromosome split. So now the chromosome, now the centromere will split. And if a centromere split, it therefore means the sister chromatids now, they move to opposite poles of the cell. All right? They can move to the opposite poles of the cell. And just to point this out, what is pulling the chromosome, as in uh, diagram one, and what is pulling the, chrom the chromatids in diagram three, it is the spindle fiber. All right? It is the spindle fiber. And, and you can also remember that uh, because the spindle fiber, fiber is also controlled to what they call a centriole. And centriole are always 90 degrees to each other. So those are things you need to point out and note, okay? All right, so let's go to the other part of the question here now. It said, draw a label diagram to show the to show the um the cell resulting from the processes shown in the diagram above and this was three marks so the diagram above right here what will be the end result of the diagrams above the last last thing so a matter of fact i will tell you that um after the anaphase two you go into telophase two right and then after telophase two you get inside the kinesis which will give you the, the individual cells now, as a result, as a result, you have four cells. If you notice here, this you have two separate cells, and each of them will split into two new cells. Hence, you have four new cells, okay? So what you have as a result here, one of those cells, they said draw a labeled diagram, which means only one of the cells, okay? And then you label it. Okay? So it's a label. So here now, one of the resulting cells will look like this. Only have one chromosome in it. Because if you should go back to even the anaphase 2 right here, if you should split this in the middle, going down the middle right here, let's do this real quick quick for you. Um, splitting in the middle, what will it eventually have? Uh, let's say I could do it real quickly. Uh, right, uh, let me see if I could do it real fast. Okay, great. So what you'll have here is that along this line, it will split, okay? It won't split as I'm on the line, but I'm going to show you that if you're going across each pole then eventually we'll have four different cells so we'll have um, one here um, two three four individual cells and each of these cells will contain only one what chromosome of course as you know eventually we talk about chromatids and so on all right but just to point that out real quick all right so let's now go into that so that will be the resulting um cell and i actually label this the nucleus the cell membrane the cytoplasm the chromosome that is in the middle of the nucleus are in the cell now for part b part b said state three differences between the processes of mitosis and meiosis now i will tell you this yes you can write you can draw charts in the exam because if you say state differences they want to see the differences an easier way to draw a chart and to show, okay, one on one side, one on the other side, or you can have a three column thing by stating what the characteristic is that you're comparing with. So, for example, I could talk about length of process and I could say shorter, longer. So, it depends on how you want to do your, your chart. But again, it's always to present your information properly so the examiner could read through and understand what you're doing. All right, so state three differences between the processes of mitosis and meiosis. So, mitosis is short. Because it's only one division, meiosis is longer because there are two divisions. In mitosis, there is no crossing over taking place. In other words, there is no exchange of genetic materials. But in meiosis, now there is a crossing over, which means there is, an, there, is, there is an exchange of genetic materials. And next difference between the processes here is that mitosis produces two daughter cells while meiosis produces four daughter cells. Another difference here is that chromosome number, the chromosome number or the amount of chromosomes remain the same within mitosis or for mitosis. So they produce daughter cells with the same number of chromosomes. However, in meiosis now, the cells are, uh, the cells or the daughter cells, they have half the number of chromosomes as the parent cell. So, because of crossing over and all over, the last point is that there is no genetic variation. For mitosis, because no crossing over, there is no genetic variation. But in meiosis, because of crossing over, 
there is vari the variety of variation within the results. Okay? So results in genetic variation among the cells. All right. So, so the offspring may look different as well as the offspring may look different from the parent. All right. All right. And so let's go to this part, which is part C of the, of the question. And this is the last part, technically, of the question. And so part C here now is that sex link traits are caused by genes carried by the X and Y chromosome. So notice it now, sex link. So these um, traits are linked to the sex chromosomes, X and Y chromosomes. But I want to point out a few things um, for you real quick as well. Is that the X and Y chromosomes may carry the trait. Now, point it out, in some instances, it's only the X is carrying the trait, and in some instances, it's only the Y carrying the trait. Now, let's go through this. It said, red-green color blindness is an example of a sex-linked trait caused by a recessive, keyword here, recessive allele of a gene on the X chromosome. And they give us how it looks. That means a small R. Okay, so red green color blindness is, is, is represented by a lowercase r, it is recessive. Now, point to note that this trait or the allele responsible for this trait can only be found on the X chromosome. It can only be found on the X chromosome. In other words, it only affects the X chromosome, not the Y. Okay, so in this case, the Y is not being affected by this allele at all or this trait. So now it said use a Punnett square show the, the possible genotypes of the offspring of a red green color blind male. So the male is red green color blind and a carrier female. The word carrier here means heterozygous. In other words, she is carrying the trait but not displaying the um, the trait, okay, just to point that out. That's what carrier mean. Hybrid mean the same thing, okay? Heterozygous mean the same thing. All right. So let's jump into it. We want to draw the Punnett square. First and foremost, look at the male and the female first. The male is red, green, color blind. And remember now, the male only carries one X. So that one single X is affected by this allele, okay? Or contains this allele. The female, she is a carrier, which means one of her X will be dominant, which means she is not um, red-green colorblind, because again, red-green colorblind is recessive. She's a carrier, so she will have the recessive allele. But because there's a dominant allele, the recessive allele will be what? Suppressed. In other words, the, the phenotypic expression of that trait will be suppressed by the dominant which is normal, which is, which is normal sight. All right, so let's look at the Punnett square now. We're going to put this in the Punnett square just as we normally do Punnett squares. So draw the square. I already go ahead and draw it for you. All right, what I want to do is to ignore what I have on the right here, which is the 25%. Do not look at that yet. Okay, again, I'll pre-do this for you to make life easier for us. The male is what I place on the top here, right? The female is on the side. You do your results. So, so the, the female is uppercase and a lowercase r. And again, the, r, the r's only can be found on the x because it only affects the x chromosome. The male is colorblind, so the small r is and is only x. In this box, we have two x's, uppercase and lowercase, as you would have seen right here. On this box, we have, a up, we have um, x and y. So we have the uppercase r, nothing on the y. In this box, you have a lowercase, two lowercase letters, which are, which are R, and they two X's. And here we have X and a Y. Now, remember, X, Y is always male, okay? Let me stop a little bit and point out something for you. For the persons who may not understand why I put the male on top of the, and, and the female on the side, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you put on the side or what on the top. It does not matter. You get the same result. The only thing is that they're going to be in different areas of the box. That's all. All right. So again, this column is for male because X and Y. This column is for female, X and Y. So the question asked, let me go back to the question and show you exactly why I have that there. All right, let's ignore that um, marking. So again, it said we want, it said no. For the three marks, it said going to use the screen to show the possible genotypes of offspring for red color blind 
male for red green colorblind males looking for the males who are red colorblind and the carrier females so let's go into it and see exactly get our percentage now so the males now the males that are um colorblind which is this right here so male colorblind will be from here to here so i put that right there okay that's the male red green colorblind male and it's only one box so it's one out of four which is 25 percent and now for the female um let me change this color real quick for you all right so for the female now she will be something um well, let's see let's put that in green all right all right so great so 25 percent of the female being carrier so this is a carrier female up here okay this female here she is colorblind because she has both the recessive allele so she is colorblind this male is a normal male so this is a normal male is not colorblind okay all right so so in other words if you notice the chance of producing um red green colorblind male and female is 50 percent chance all right and of course you could analyze this to get some more information from it all right let's jump into our next part of the question and this seems like it's the last part of the question so we're almost there all right so it's explain why it is not possible for a red green colorblind female to have a son with a normal color vision three marks now this is the outline i could draw something for you to show you exactly what i mean right and so the first point is that the colorblind trait is only carried on the x chromosome so that's very important to note okay boys inherit their x chromosomes from their mothers okay boys don't get x from their fathers they only get the y chromosome from their fathers they get their x from their what mothers so if the mother now is red colorblind that means she is homozygous recessive in other words both our x chromosomes must be affected by it and so then if both our x if, if if both x chromosomes are affected by the the recessive allele then her son must inherited must inherit the affected x chromosome why since both of our x are carrying the colorblind allele and remember the boy must the boy must get the x from the mother so let me do something really quick and fast for you to understand this right again it doesn't matter what the father is in this case it doesn't matter what the father is so this now is the mother right let's put the mother on top uh, let's put the mother here x with two small r's x all right so that's the mother there x with small r's the father let's put the father be normal right so the farm the father with, with this x will be uppercase r right and then now um the father with the y here you have x uppercase r x lowercase r and here you have x uppercase r and x lowercase r those two on the top there they are all females and they are both carriers okay the male now the male now will be x with a small r. the y is not showing anything on it the x again is small r and is there so the males that are produced at the lower at the lower level of the um chart right here both males are also colorblind because again they get the x from their what mother so that's what i'm going to show you right there right they get their x's from their what mother so again if we go back to the statement, it state that um if a female right that is red green color blind can um will have son cannot have son with normal color blind uh, with normal vision so in other words the sons must also be color blind okay all right so there we come at the end of the lesson and so again um a pleasure for me to share with you and try and um, for you to try to pass examination so until next time i'm trying to come with more reviews so stay blessed stay safe.